So Jacques Fitzsimmons is going to come talk talk to us uh, about something which I have to admit I'm 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 it's a little opaque to me um, because either he's going to make frameworks that are opaque transparent or make things that were transparent so opaque. But in terms of a framework for data science, last talk of the morning, uh, Jack, please take it away. Okay, thank you for staying for lunch. So <laughs> obviously not the, the busiest talk of the day, but I think that's okay. Um, so yeah, today we're gonna talk a bit about uh, Isoloft data science, um, as, as we call it. And it's a kind of a, a relatively new paradigm, but it's been worked on for the last, I don't know, I guess 15 years or so. Um, and I think it's finally coming together towards something that's like quite usable in production. Um, I guess a bit of a background is that, um, <laughs> is that many of us worked in like machine learning and data science in, in the past. Uh, one of the really frustrating things was that you would be put on a new project or something, and then suddenly you'd have to wait for ages before you get access to the data you needed to do your job, right? So like, there's just red tape. And, and most of how people get access to data is still the same way that was created in like the 1990s, like row-based access control. So you have some databases and there's some tables and either you have access to the tables or you have access to views of the tables or something like that, but it's, it's relatively restrictive. And so if you think about most organizations, often the most important and impactful information is actually the most sensitive. So if you work in, let's say, Airbnb, then, I mean, I'm not dissing Airbnb, I'm just saying as a company, right? You, your data scientists necessarily need to know like what the trends are, what's going on, et cetera. But equally, you don't want anyone to see maybe like their friend or family member's recent holidays, right? So how do you balance these two things? So we often say that we live kind of like in the era of data. I guess most people here obviously are involved either in Jupyter or like from a data science background. Um, yet still the most impactful data is behind closed doors. So you can go on Kaggle and pull down open data sets, but you're probably not going to do the next massive uh, scientific breakthrough in that fashion. Realistically, that data is in hospitals or in research institutes. Um, and it, it might be hard to access even if you work in that organization. And it's not just something that we complain about. If uh, My background is in machine learning, so um, even like the, the kind of most famous people in the machine learning domain would kind of say at this point that a lot of um, a lot of the big problems aren't necessarily around building better models. So you can learn about your lipshit constant regression model or your determinantal point processes or whatever, but it actually makes no difference if you don't have access to any data that you can model or use. So Andrew Ng says that the data is food for AI, and for most problems, the model is already in a state that it's usable, even in production, but getting access to, to the data is, is, the, is the pain point. So how do we work today in like, uh, yeah, as data scientists or something? Typically speaking, we have a computer or a server which we kind of completely run, uh, have full control over, and we connect to a database or maybe a data warehouse or some data infrastructure, and we pull down the data we want locally, and then we examine it, we look at it, we try to do some um, maybe data visualization or exploratory data analysis, et cetera, or maybe some modeling, and we go from there. So the paradigm is the data scientist has to get full access to the data that they're working with. So what we advocate for is actually to put essentially a man in the middle. Um, and this man in the middle should have some ideal properties that are sometimes hard to achieve, but that we've been working quite hard to get towards. So the idea would be that the data could be pulled down into kind of a black box that's opaque at runtime, so people can't see the data as it's being processed and which can guarantee that the insights and the values that are extracted by a data scientist or data user are safe and can't be used to reverse engineer the original inputs. Now doing that is maybe not super trivial, right? How do you create this black box without just shifting trust from, from one person over to another? And the approach that we've been taking is by using something called privacy enhancing technologies, or PETs as we call them. So privacy is usually the like painful thing that data scientists don't want to think about. And that might involve um, like privacy policies and, and consent policies when you go onto a website or make a purchase order. Um, knowing where your data is, kind of in the data governance sense, how long has it been there, when do you need to delete it, et cetera. Um, making sure that data is deleted at appropriate time. These are all part of like the GDPR conversation or CCPA, et cetera. But pets really focus on how you process data and how you use data. 
um, and they're a set of technologies, and they try to guarantee that data is only used for its intended purpose, that you can combine different data sources to be able to maybe join together healthcare information with like socioeconomic information or something like that, which together might be much more interesting but also more sensitive than them individually, and how to disseminate uh, insights or models that you've trained on the data such that the people who you give that to can't use it to reverse engineer the original inputs. If you think about it, this domain is like 100 years old to some degree because it's kind of what the census does. So every couple of years, they go around, they collect information from people, they try to keep that data very secure. They manually go through data disclosure controls and they create reports that are shared to inform governments. The idea here now is like, how do you automate that process and use technology to guarantee these steps as opposed to kind of, you know, hoping bureaucracy kind of works it out slowly but surely. So there's two main forms of privacy enhancing technologies. Um, one broad category is called input privacy. So when you send data from a database or even from your computer to a server, how do you know that your inputs into that, that function or that calculation are protected and are only used for its intended purpose? So think about if you uh, go into Google Translate and you say, translate this legal document. Well, typically speaking, you know, you've got a TLS connection, that your query is going to go to Google. But you don't know what Google does with it. Does it go into a log file? Is it used for further training down the line? Does it occasionally get checked by, I don't know, someone on some reg team or something? Uh, probably, all of those things. Um, so you don't really have any control. You don't really know where the boundaries are when you send the data. So input privacy is when you send that data, you know exactly how it's being used, and it can't be used outside of that context as guaranteed by the tech itself. Output privacy is all about if I make some calculations on a data set, so I have a set of values, how do I make sure that when I share it with someone, they can't use it to reverse engineer any of the original inputs? And what we're trying to do with anti-granular, which is what we're going to talk about now in a second, is bring these two types of technologies together to create these great little black boxes that can sit between the, the, the data sets and, and the users. There's lots of different ways you can try to achieve this. There's different technologies, schools of thoughts, et cetera. Um, but the way we're working on it is basically using something called secure enclaves um, with differential privacy. So secure enclaves, as I'll describe in a second, are like very restricted, isolated environments that guarantee the code that's running inside as you connect to them. Um, and they've really grown in popularity, so they're now available on every major cloud provider. Uh, Intel uh, produced one of the earliest chips called the Intel SGX. That's being sunsetted now. They've got a bigger chip now called the TDX. AMD has offerings. NVIDIA is releasing the first Enclave GPUs in Q3 of this year, and they'll be available on Azure. AWS has, actually, they use the Nitro cards. So the same thing that's keeping um, you know, Netflix and Chase both use AWS, right? So in some cases, they could be using the same you know, physical hardware, but they're isolated from one another by partitions on the CPU and RAM. And so they create a kind of a virtualized enclave based on the same technology. So first, enclaves, what's going on there? Second, differential privacy, what's going on there? And then let's see, how do we put it together and actually create like a user flow that a data scientist can actually use yeah, in real life? So enclaves are basically just servers. They don't have uh, hard disks, but they have CPU and RAM, and they partition CPU and RAM. So you spin up like a little VM that runs inside, and the underlying hardware hashes the boot time operating system and all the software that's inside, and creates a little document with those hashes, and the underlying hardware, or um, like cloud provider, digitally signs a little document. So when you connect to it, let's go. When you connect to it, you do a handshake with the, the server. And instead of just getting back a TLS certificate or something to, so you know you're connecting to the right place, you also get this attestation document that says, this is running this, you know, this code as guaranteed by those hashes. So if you think your Docker image A is running on there, and those hashes don't agree, then you know something has changed along the way. You're not connecting to the thing you wanted. They've also got um, very strict isolation properties. So traffic can only go in and out through virtual sockets, which really restricts uh, how traffic, I mean, how any data can go in and out, which kind of puts a real big barrier of entry. And even someone who's running uh, an enclave in their cloud will find it extremely difficult, if not impossible, to see what's running inside during runtime. 
Uh, and you can use this to create shared keys. So if you're running an Enclave on, on your cloud account, I can connect to it and send traffic back and forth and even trust that you who owns the cloud account can't see the traffic I'm sending back and forth. So you've got that kind of end-to-end um, -end privacy or security. The second area is, is quite maths heavy, so I love when someone puts up a big equation and then tries to explain it in front of a tired audience who would rather be having lunch, but here we go. <laughs> so what differential privacy is, it's uh, an approach that was only invented, I think, in 2006, 2005, um, by a group of researchers in the US. And they thought about privacy in a bunch of different ways, but they tried to come to a kind of a conclusive approach of how you can deal with output privacy. And the challenge with a lot of things is, you know, there can be like PII information. So companies often like mask certain fields, like names or credit card details. But these always led to linkage attacks. So let's just go to that Airbnb example again. If I know that you were in Paris in, you know, May right now, and you were in New York in January, and you were somewhere else in December, like not that many people in the world had that little pathway, right? So by just connecting a few data points, you can often one for one re-identify people from a data set. So what they go about it is they actually don't think about what the individual information means, and instead they try to make a, a simple claim. So they say if there's a data set X, will also be a data set Y, and you take some measurements from it, um, and the only difference between data set X and data set Y is that, let's say, Alice or any one person exists in one and they don't exist in the other. Well, your guessing probability should be essentially bounded by a constant, uh, e to the epsilon. So the best guess you could possibly take of saying whether or not Alice is in that data set or not um, is, is random. Uh, and this is usually achieved by adding noise to the results. Um, and you know what the best guess they can possibly take is, and it's bounded by this epsilon. And there's some really nice properties to this. So if you take 10 different queries, you train 10 different machine learning models, and they have epsilon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 10, then the total epsilon over all of those queries is just the sum of those, those budgets. So you can track it, just like in a log, like, oh, Timmy has used epsilon equals 20 right now. And then he makes another query, and now it's 21. And you can put limits in that that are no longer based on strict access, no access, but rather more nuanced as to the amount of information they're extracting and how granular that information is uh, in real time. So how, how do we actually try to use these things? Well, the first thing is, is we've put together a Jupyter kernel, um, a Jupyter kernel manager that runs inside of these enclaves, these isolated environments. And then what we've done is we've created a runtime environment that runs a very restricted version of Python inside. And so it uses some static analysis tools. Uh, we try to leverage the ones that are more mature, like MyPy, restricted Python, et cetera, to make sure that people are only using functions in the correct way, or methods and classes. Um, we have private data types, which kind of wrap regular data types, but limit what interactions you can do to them. And we restrict a whole bunch of the built-in methods, et cetera, so you can't really you know, there's no like opening a socket or writing to disk or even inspecting the ID of like a, a variable, et cetera. Um, and then we, we, we combine that to make sure that the data flow essentially, it goes from sensitive data through some sort of like truncations, like, you know, where or whatever, and eventually a measurement, which is like an aggregate step. So this would be like one epoch for your machine learning model, or it could be a, uh, a query, like an SQL query or something like that, which is aggregate, where a little bit of noise gets applied. And then that is the transformation from private land to public land. And anything that's public, you can bring back down to your lo local Jupyter context and use just like any other variable. So the, the real question that we were working on over the last while is how do you integrate this into a data science workflow that just feels natural and doesn't feel like you have to learn anything? And so we're trying to make it magic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, keyword here. So um, I think most people might be familiar with um, like cell magic in, in Jupyter Notebooks. And so the way we've gone about it is just created uh, anti-granular, we call it, with the magic um, AG. So any cell that you put in the AG magic, that cell is actually going to be executed remotely in this trusted and secured environment. Um, and only 
basically like declassified, you can think of it, information that's gone through that differentially private step can be brought back down to your local context. And so here you could see we have a data frame with a column, let's say year, and we want to get the average of that. And so our epsilon and our delta are like our privacy budgets, so we're spending some on, on getting the average or the mean, or it could be a variant, whatever. Um, now X is no longer uh, secret because it's gone through that data disclosure step and we can export it. So we can say export X as X safe, let's say. And X safe is now available in your local Jupyter context again. So, I mean, imagine you're in a kitchen and you're cooking for a vegetarian, but you eat meat and you have two different counters. So you're like cooking something on one side and then you step over just to work on like the stuff that you need to keep away until it's time to bring it all together again. So you can just toggle back and forth between regular Jupyter and like the restricted privacy kind of compliant uh, Jupyter. And um, we've also passed back all of the errors. So if you try to access sensitive data and you can't, so if you're doing like iLock or if you're trying to like, I don't know, pull some variable out of a data frame or put it into a global or something like that, um, it throws runtime errors and that gets passed back to your Jupyter uh, notebook locally. So it comes up just like as a regular error, but it'll be like a dynamic analysis check or a static analysis check, et cetera. And we, the differential privacy, so the application of adding noise, um, we've just worked with like all of the largest um, groups out there who are building frameworks. And there's a really big community, and while it might seem niche maybe to like the broader data science community, there's like thousands of people working on this. So there's OpenDP, which is like a, an entire institute now at Harvard that created uh, the OpenDP framework. The Smart Noise, um, which is uh, within Microsoft. DiffPrivLib is a library that came from IBM Research, uh, written by an Irish guy uh, in Blanchardstown. So uh, Nisha, good for him. We're representing on the world stage. Um, and so what we do is, is we're basically just trying to restrict everything down, get it to run inside these secured environments, and basically pass off or delegate those uh, data disclosure controls to the, the libraries that are being actively built by you know, top groups around the world. Great. So, haha, 15 minutes. Okay. I ideally want to run through just like a very quick demo, then like kind of tell you about something that's upcoming, and then otherwise I just, there's not that many people here, so <laughs> we can get some feedback from, from those uh, in the audience and like thoughts and next steps, et cetera. Is that too small? Or, um, is that better? Yeah. So the nice thing about this is it is just a Jupyter like backend extension, right? Like it's just a, so it runs pretty much on any, you know, if you want to go on Google Colab or Binder, Data Lore, I don't know, Jupyter Hub, Jupyter Notebook, <laughs> anywhere you want, uh, it, it should run fine. We just explain the concepts again. But the, the only thing you really have to do is just, um, so I don't think you can pip install it yet, but maybe by the end of the month or something, it should be should be available. Uh, but you just import anti-granular as AG, uh, kind of a pretty basic step. <laughs> uh, and then you log in. So the way we've built this is um, we've made it like free, publicly available, et cetera. And we're hoping to be running competitions off it so people can compete in like Kaggle style competitions where they don't actually see the raw data and build their own libraries, et cetera. So, um, obviously, if you were inside a corporate network or something, this would be whatever OAuth you use in internally, but it's basically an OAuth login. Um, so you just log in to, you know, to the environment, and when you do so, it will create a session. So it'll like spin up a Jupyter kernel for you. Um, every kernel gets a session ID, um, and so that's obviously shared between yourself and the remote uh, server, and it's also embedded into the JSON, that's the Jupyter notebook itself. So we'll very shortly be rendering them in sight. So if you do something cool with, with these frameworks and you want to show it off to your friends because that's how your friends know you're really cool, <laughs> um, uh, that's, that little uh, ID is embedded into the Jupyter Notebook. So when you upload your Jupyter Notebook, we can associate um, the actual code execution and like how much privacy budget you used, what the accuracy was, et cetera, et cetera, um, with the, the notebook and create like really interesting metadata so you can like filter and learn from one another, et cetera, too. Um, there's an export function. So if you have a numeric type, a string, a list, dict, tuple, whatever, and you export something from your restricted Python uh, enclave, essentially, and you say, hey, export number two as X, well, what happens is 
it brings it back to your local instance, and you can just print, you know, or you can do whatever you want with X. So look what's in X now on your lo local Jupyter session, X. And, and you get back, obviously, the number two, because it's just been set. It's been passed back from the restricted environment back to your computer. You can do the same thing with strings, as I said, lists, dictionaries, tuples, etc. If you try to do something like throw an error, so we restrict down what you can do. We don't want people doing async in there or uh, like throwing errors based on like a sensitive value as you're iterating through them or something. So if you try to do anything that would that, that's blocked either at AST level or like a runtime uh, issue, um, we catch it and we, we give you back an error. So you get runtime errors that appear as like native errors in your Jupyter notebook, but actually happened off, you know, miles away in that, that, uh, that, that secured environment. Um, and that could be like AST checks, as I said. That can also be around scope. So one thing that we wanted was if you have a data frame and you want to apply a function to it. So you apply and you give a callable. Um, and so it would iterate through every element in your data frame it would apply the callable to that value um, or series or whatever. Um, so you don't want somebody getting those values, saving it to a global, and now suddenly they can export that back. So we're quite restrictive on the scopes of how you can use it. So your, your methods have to be kind of pure. Has anyone ever written like a functional programming language here before? Uh, I see some nods. OK, good. So there's a concept of like pure methods. And Python kind of has something like this too. So uh, we block like uh, non-locals, freeze, globals, et cetera, within a method. So the things you can access within your functions are like the parameters which you passed in and the global methods which are available to you through your imports or through methods that you've defined somewhere else. Um, there's data frames. So usually you don't see this bit. I just, I just did it for um, to be like kind of explicit. Um, so typically when you connect in, you would say, connect me to this competition data set or to uh, a data set from a particular, I don't know, database somewhere or something like that. Uh, and this step is already done for you, but I just wanted to show kind of how it's created. So essentially, um, if you have a regular like data frame, um, the, the private data frames just wrap that. So it holds the data frame inside it. Uh, it limits the API interface to that data frame uh, strongly, and it requires metadata which are typically like the bounds of what the values can take on. That's important because if you were, had a database of salaries and you wanted to know if Alice was in that database or not, well, if you know the salary range she can take on is like zero to 100 grand, let's say, something like that, well, then you know the total sum could only have moved by 100 grand by that one contribution to the database, if that makes sense. So we need to keep track of this metadata. And when you do an apply function or I don't, you do any methods to it, we can continuously update what that metadata is throughout the process um, and clip values to that, just in case. And also, private data gets an ID. So if you do a privacy request to do some calculation, that gets fired off to uh, uh, a little controller who says, yes, you have permission. No, you do not have a permission. And so if you try to use up too much privacy, you get blocked. Um, and you can do a lot of, I don't want to say all, but you can do a lot of um, the data frame built-ins. So if you want to get the sum of things, the mean of things, standard deviations, counts, variances, medians, quantiles, I don't know, skew, kurtosis. Does anyone actually ever use them? No? OK. Uh, they're available. So um, all of these methods have been created from one popular library or another. Um, and so we've just wrapped the built-ins, so you have the exact same interface, but now you just spend a little bit of privacy budget. Um, and so it kind of you know, teaches you to be frugal, you know? Don't ask too many questions. If you think about it, so I, I used to work in an um, energy trading company, and everyone was traders. So the thing that would happen all the time is p-hacking, where people would like keep looking at things until they thought they saw a pattern. So this kind of naturally forces you not to do that, because every time you're asking a question, you're kind of spending some privacy budget. So it's kind of keeping you honest uh, in your day-to-day -day as well. So Great. And fortunately, there's also um, interfaces for popular libraries. So if you're familiar with uh, scikit-learn, there's a framework called diffprivlib that has most of the methods. No, that's maybe not true. It has some subset of popular methods, uh, to be more exact, um, that allow you to model things. but it, it applies differential privacy to the training steps, 
so the model itself is safe to share or disseminate or use upstream. So in just a simple example here, we have a private data frame of inputs, um, inputs PDF, like private data frame. Probably PDF's a bad. Anyway, we'll think of a better name for that. So um, you have your inputs, and then you have your, your targets, which are also private. And you can just take all the words are the same. We just put the word private in front of it. So that way, it's kind of you know, trivial to remember. So you can have like a private random forest classifier instead of a random forest classifier. Works the same way. All you have to do is just add your epsilon, like uh, how much you want to, how much privacy budget you want to spend on training that thing. And you can train it, and then you can make some predictions, download the predictions. You could download the model itself as well. And here we are, matplotlib. This is an amazing plot of uh, <laughs> your super interesting <laughs> random forest that learned a little bit of a sine wave step functions. Uh, but you, you, get, you get the point. And there's a lot of libraries that we, we're still um, uh, like kind of wrapping and including. So these include uh, synthetic data libraries. So you can create um, fake data that, that looks and feels very like the real data, but is differentially private. So it basically fits a model to the data, and then it samples from that model. So you're not directly seeing the data. And there's uh, training mechanisms for TensorFlow and PyTorch. There's, um, you know, you can do histograms and pull back the data and then use Plotly if you want or Matplotlib or whatever you like to plot or inspect things. Um, but you have those guarantees the whole way through. Um, as I said earlier, we're, we're trying to launch kind of like a competitions <laughs> approach to it because the more people who use it and get pain points, the better feedback we get. Also, the opportunity is for people to build their own libraries and, and add to it, et cetera, uh, which ultimately makes it a better ecosystem for everyone. So we're doing the first uh, launch of that in July in Dublin. And we have some like amazing speakers. So some of the people who are literally like people who invented part of the field, like Salil uh, from Harvard. He's coming over. He'll be, be there in Dublin with us. Um, some of the guys from the Office of National Statistics in the UK are coming over. Uh, the Federal Statistics Office from Switzerland are coming over. So we'll have a really big group of people who care about privacy and work on these things a lot. And uh, I'd really encourage anyone to just go to antigranular.com and they can come along for free. And we're Irish, so there's plenty of beer and food. And uh, <laughs> it should be good fun. Uh, so what else do you do on a summer holiday? So uh, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much for um, sitting in through your lunch. And we have just a few minutes, so like, I'd love to hear any questions or any thoughts or feedback or what you would do differently. Uh, or yeah, well, we can leave it there. Oh, question in the back. Thanks for the talk. Are these privacy budgets like a, a lifetime thing associated with you and the data set? And could two users conspire to add their credits together to try and get around the, the budget? So yes, absolutely. So if you if you like really care about differential privacy, you want the access to a data set to kind of always go through it because they're summed. So you, they literally add together. So if you have multiple users, you can calculate that per user, per group, and lifetime, like overall um, budget spent. And this isn't like crazy stuff, by the way. So this is the, the tools that were used in the US Census um, in 2020. So like they're now becoming quite popular and used by governments and stuff. Um, and one of the criticisms that the US government got for releasing the census doing this was how they chose their epsilon. So how, how much epsilon is like a permittable amount to make public? Of course, you could have what is a permittable amount to give to the sales and marketing team or the, I don't know, who are different internal teams, et cetera. And that's something that can be kind of chosen and decided upon based on like how risky it's perceived within an organization. But yeah, you can look at like macro as well as like micro. We present, I, I learned a lot about the user perspective as a data scientist working against the data, but I'm curious about the, the line between uh, the person, someone provides data, the the anti-granular platform service, and then the data scientist. What parts do you see that this, how much of this is for self-hosting versus uh, using services? Where is the line drawn and plan to be drawn yeah. in the future? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a really good question. So 
Um, we're building this. It's it's going to be open source and stuff. We just <laughs> it's a little bit rough. Documentation talk. The last talk was something we need to dive into a bit more. Um, but nevertheless, so uh, our kind of like belief system here is that for anti granular as for like competitions and stuff, really you want to have as many people who want to join as can. So in that context, you shouldn't actually be sharing public or like super sensitive private information for the competition. So it's more like a training ground for people. When people actually go to deploy this themselves, it should be deployed in their own infrastructure and uh, a model that's like often used in other tools and products in the kind of security privacy stack is um, trust but verify. So the nice thing about this is that, okay, you can trust it. You know what code's running inside. You know the attestation codes that are being signed off, et cetera. But it's running in your VPCs, in your infrastructure, in your cloud accounts. So you can also set up VPC rules. You can do CloudWatch rules. You can you know, look at the entire environment, like the access control, like what IAM users are allowed to have access, or what if you're using Okta or OAuth, you know, how do you permit people to even access it, et cetera. So um, it's, it's a really kind of like important tool in the greater thing, but you can actually just verify that there's no like outbound calls. You can verify like the size of packets seem normal and stuff like that, even though they're encrypted. So you can still verify it, even though you're trusting it in order to broker that, that trust between multiple parties. And we also always kind of say, I mean, like, so we do a lot of work with the United Nations and with different uh, like national statistics organizations, and like they're just not going to trust, like, you know, like <laughs> hey, give us all your country's data. Like, yeah, that's never, ever, ever going to happen. So um, like the feedback we got very early on was like, build something secure, get all of the certifications you need, and then give it into the hands of the people who are going to be running it with like good education material, et cetera, so that they can self-host and manage it themselves. Thanks very much, Jack. Appreciate Great. it. Thank you.